Oh, did you just let her? Hello, good evening, good morning, wherever you happen to be. Welcome once again to um, the Coracle Live Books, Bards, and Ballads, where we are going to be chatting with Jenna Tellenju, founder of the Sisterhood of Avalon, author of six wonderful books, um, and that includes the Avalonian Oracle deck. And tonight, specific, I'm Morgan, I'm sorry, I'm Morgan. And tonight we're going to be specifically chatting with Jenna on her latest book, The Ninefold Way of Avalon, Walking the Path of the Priestess. So, hi, Jenna. Hi, Morgan. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Thank you for um, so, yes. being here with us this evening. And those who will be watching later, glad you could be here. And I thank you for your patience, you know, waiting the week for this interview. So I think everything's going to be just lovely. So, Jenna, good evening. Good evening. So um, why don't we start where we had attempted to start and um, tell us just a little bit about the book and then have you read that excerpt from the introduction that you could share with us, please? Sure. So... I'm really excited about this book. This is the book that um, honestly, I wish I had had when I first started on the Avalon path. Um, it's a bit of a chonker. It's 504 pages long and I had to pull a lot of things out of it. Uh, my intention was this, you know, um, to kind of pull together all of the pieces of information that we have about Avalon uh, to kind of bring together uh, the streams of tradition that inform the Avalon as we have uh, received her in the present through the stream of time, through the through the medium of tale, through history, through legends, and uh, to, to research and to pull together information about what we do know about priestesses from Celtic traditions, holy women uh, throughout time and in different cultural areas, and to use all of that information to inform a practice of coming into relationship with Avalon. So uh, I, I laugh about this book a little bit. I call it my um, my my mullet book uh, because it has all the research in the front and it has all the practice in the back. Um, so I think I'd like to think there's a, there's something for everyone, whether or not you follow the Avalonian tradition or if you're just interested in information about Avalon, solid academic research information about Avalon or about Celtic priestesses or about um, some of the information about the uh, the otherworldly islands that that uh, are, are in a lot of Celtic lands. So um, all of that is in the front, and if you're interested in the practice piece and coming into relationship that that is present too of course one informs the other but um i think that uh you know uh it has a wide um i don't know scope of interest but uh hopefully people will um uh, will like both parts uh but if not there's something for everyone there so thank you and uh and, and i guess everything that i just said is kind of what uh you know the little excerpt that i wanted to start with um so if i if i should just do that so, from the moment I first became aware of Avalon, I have endeavored to find her. First, in the pages of literature, later through the discipline of academia, and always, humbly, through the promptings of spirit. I have searched for Avalon in the echoes of myth, through the vessel of the landscape, in moon-drenched orchards, and in collective woman song. I have sought her I have sought her out in lonely library stacks, between the yellow pages of outer print treasures and in the late night illumination of digitized journals. I have journeyed through more subtle realms, stepping over threshold thresholds, passing over nine waves, and learning to kindle a fire in the hearth of my heart. Along this journey, I have witnessed Avalon as a shapeshifter, here a paradise ripe with fruit, rich with grain and grapes and honey, there, a college of druidesses, a cloister of priestesses, greatly knowledgeable in mathematics and astronomy, mistresses in the arts of music, of healing, of alchemy, flying forth from their island home as flocks of black-feathered birds, to places of learning, to fields of battle, to gather around fountains, some sweet with need, others tinged with iron. Sometimes she is a symbol of resistance, a symbol of hope persisting, the resting place of Arthur, the once and future king. Sometimes he is healed, awaiting the moment of Britain's greatest need, 
Sometimes he is buried, his name etched upon a leaden cross. Always he is in the keeping of she who is born of the sea, Morgan, his ally and enemy, his healer and sister, the barge queen who lays his wounded head upon her lap, and the first of nine sisters who lays his wounded body upon her golden bed. So just to skip a little. The challenge and charge of those who seek to walk the ways of Avalon is to become a whole, as whole a vessel as we can in order to carry the waters of this particular stream of tradition, to allow it to induce transformation in our lives and reawaken, and reawaken the sovereignty of self that we have far too often deferred. It is only when we are able to fill the vessel of the self with these waters that we can be in service as a cauldron kindler, a cup bearer, or a grail maiden, both for ourselves and for others. We can engage in priestess service that aims to catalyze and heal, inspire and protect, support and envision, remember and create, express and celebrate, bridging the space between the worlds to allow the creative essence of the Awen to flow through us, both in sovereignty and in service. So just a little taste of the book and how it came to be, I guess. That's beautiful. Um, mm, thank you. I've loved all your books. This one has grabbed me differently mm. than the other ones have. Um, I'm just getting past the front and hitting the back for the for the practice. And, uh, and I'm just fascinated in... I keep feeling, okay, so Alan, from you to us, this is a beautiful gift. Mm. As I'm reading, this is just, I'm just amazed at what I'm reading and adding more to the Avalonian knowledge that I've had and learned from you over the past years. Um, one of the things that, um, for those of us who aren't sisters and um, that we, you talk a lot about in your book, um, being a bridge mm -hmm. so how would you how would you explain being a bridge within the way of the path of the peace just so it's informed by a couple of things uh first of all one of the things that i i endeavored to do is i studied all of the ways in which both in in lore and in history and um uh, and in legends, uh, the ways in which women are in service, the ways in which women in various iterations serve as a intermediary between this world and the other world. So you can look at, for example, uh, sovereignty goddesses who uh, embody the energy of the land. And it is through her, through her physical being, that uh, a king is invested with the ability to rule. So she acts as a bridge between this world and the other world. When we look at the, the cauldron kindlers, the nine maidens of Anuven, it is through them that they bridge uh, the poet uh, and, and the bard who receive the Awen through, the, through this cauldron. Um, when we look at the grail bearers, when we look at uh, the ladies of the lake, uh, like the Lady of Lina van Vach, all of these fairy queens and, and, and um, fairy brides, and you know all of these different iterations, what we see is the feminine principle serving as a doorway, serving as a bridge between this world and the other world. And what comes through depends on the situation. It depends on, um, you know, what service is being given. And it's in, a, in effect a kind of contract. There's a door between this world and the other world. It, it seems like, it seemed to me as I was looking through all of these stories and bringing them all together, whether, and, and when we look at the historical record, where we know that uh, women in Celtic lands and in, in various cultures were druidesses well were, were poets were um were, were seers were, were healers and they seem to have this mediating principle they bring something through and they send something back so they serve as a doorway they serve as a bridge and it seems like this is the fundamental function for all of these different iterations one of the things about these nine folds that we see whether we're looking at them from history whether we're looking at them from lore is that they have a lot of different functions they're weather workers they're healers they're they're teachers Teachers, they're learned women. They 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 know mathematics. They they're seers. They bring forth vision. Um, so when you break down all of these fundamental fu uh, fundament all of these um, all of these ways of being in service, the fundamental function is to serve as a bridge. 
So that's one piece. And the other piece comes to us from the Mabinagi, from the second branch, where we learn about, um, you know, and this, I think, underscores a lot of the work that we do in the sisterhood in our priestessing service is that, um, you know, Bron, Bron the Blessed, he says, a voben bid bond. One who would be a leader must be a bridge. And he literally becomes a bridge over which his men can walk because he's a giant. And, and in her own way, Bronwyn uh, is, uh, is is an iteration of a motif that we call the, uh, the peace weaver. And this is an actual real um, thing that women in the, in the medieval period were, noble women served as peace weavers. They lay down their bodies literally to bring peace between warring factions, warring nations, um, you know, to, 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 to merge the, uh, the, the, the lineages to bring peace. And so uh, that also speaks to this idea of being a bridge, of being, of being a, a doorway, of being in service between this world and the other world for ourselves and for each other. Okay, before we continue, I just want to let everyone know that if you have any questions, if you could pop them in the chat with a big cue ahead, and we'll, you know, we'll probably save them toward the end. So any questions you have for Jenna from what she's saying or anything else, um, just pop it in and we will discuss them at the end. Thank you. So Jenna, going from being a bridge, um, please just sing as a verb. Mm -hmm. Um, could you explain that a little bit? So I think that um, because our, our concept of priestessing is one of being in service, it, it really comes down to this idea that uh, being a priestess is something that you do rather than something that you are. It's not a laurel that we sit upon. It is an act of service. And in the sisterhood, you know, we, um, we encourage and we help women grow into their service as priestesses, but we don't uh, initiate priestesses. We, you know, we we are involved in, uh, you know, helping women come into their priestess service and as Avalonian priestesses, which is for me means women who are priestessing in the way of Avalon, one that acknowledges. Uh, our own sovereignty, one that acknowledges the sovereignty of others, and as teachers or as facilitators, uh, try to hold a space of sovereignty for those that we are with. So it is this uh, idea of priestess being in service, and there are many ways of being in service, but it is uh, it is an action. It is something, something that we're actively doing, and there are many ways of being a priestess, and I think that that's the biggest piece like many ways of being the bridge. It's not just the ways that I think a lot of us think about in uh, neo-paganism today. Like a priestess is a woman who, um, you know, facilitates a ritual or facilitates a, a group or, um, you know, is a teacher or is a healer or is a, a, you know, a seer. I think there are many ways of priestessing and many ways of being in service, being that bridge. We can be a priestess in our activism. We can be a priestess in our scholarship. We can be a priestess in our, um, in our community building and holding those community containers. We can be a priestess in the things that we create in the world, whether it's music or art or or craft or, um, or, or, or you know, anything we can envision and bring through from the other world into this world. These are ways of being in priestess service. These are ways of being a bridge. So I think that that is it, you know, the idea of expanding the idea of what it means to be a priestess. And I think one of the things that I like to, um, highlight especially is this idea and and this comes from decades of working with women uh you know we're, we're talking uh about you know who they are and what they do and what their path is in the world and you know there's this reflection sometimes oh, i'm just a wife and mother or i'm just a homekeeper and i think that that is um a really skewed view i think of um of an important service of that being a caregiver being a mother holding space in a community um you know tending a household uh being being a resource uh, uh, you know, these are these are sacred acts of so the idea of tending the hearth fire, you know, the, the Celtic roundhouse has the central fire and the cauldron hangs there. It, is, it was the center of community, it was the center of family, it's where you went to, um, to eat and to feast and to celebrate, to hear stories, to receive healing, um, to engage in ritual, uh, to come in community, to, to be, in, you know, a, a, you know, the councils that that served, you know, the homestead. I mean, it was a really important place, and I think um, to put that on par to say that that is a that is a way of being in sacred priestess service is to is to maintain the hearth, and uh, and to to stoke and keep that sacred flame alight. 
Now that's something I wish I knew when I was younger and stayed home as a stay at home mm-hmm. raising my kids, because that's that conversation that you have. It's like, I don't do anything. Mm-hmm. When it's, you do everything. You do everything. And, and I think that, you know, we, I think we flow into priestess service as well, because, you know, there is a time in my life where I was a heart tender more so than I am now. There is a time, you know, I think we can, we can have different types of service at different points in our lives and uh, and to embrace what that looks like and to see the sacred in that which we do that we are in service to our community we are in service to the gods when we are when we are doing you know where our calling is at any given time and that can shift i think that's one of the things that i've learned mostly over the past few years and in the reading of the book because i always thought when i first learned about the ninefold i'm a healer that i never looked beyond that because I figured that's what I was and in reading the book and in you know learning your teachings and talking to other sisters through the years it's like I actually do carry a small piece of each one of the nine mm-hmm. within so I'm mm-hmm. not just healer I'm you know the artisan or you know the seer the ritualist you know that standing there is is you know so I've I've gotten that. And I think that's, that's a beautiful thing for women to learn. Mm -hmm. And and I'm glad you brought that up because the thing about the ninefold, and it's sort of this central organizing principle that this book and the sisterhood, and, you know, it seems like uh, the sacred women have embraced, you know, through the centuries uh, that the ninefold isn't just what is without us. It is what is within us as well, that we are comprised, you know, the idea of nine as, as a wholeness, as, as, as a fullness, as a full set. Um, you know, we see the number nine over and over again, especially in the uh, context of, um, of sacred communities of women, but also in other places. That's part of the thing. Like, why are there these historical uh, ninefolds that we see in more and in legend? Why? Why do they, are they all part of a, uh, a way of being in, religious service? Is it a a cultural piece? Is it something that came from a Celtic homeland and spread over time? Is it something that people uh, adapted from each other? Uh, But it may also just be what the meaning of nine is in your new European cultures, and that is that it represents a wholeness. And what that says to me is that, uh, and we can see that in, um, you know, in, in, uh, in numerology today, right? Uh, So it's not just this ancient idea of what nine is. And, you know, perhaps that is part of where that comes from is the idea that it takes nine months for a baby to be born, it takes nine months for all the pieces to come into place for something new to arise. It, it's what something is complete. So a complete set. But we see it not just in the religious women's uh, spectrum, but we see it in the Welsh laws. We see it in Irish tradition. We see it over and over again, iterations of nine being a complete set. And so that speaks to me of this idea of nine as a wholeness and that the ninefold is within us as well we are made up we have these nine aspects of ourselves and our work to be whole you know i spoke a little bit about this vessel of sovereignty the vessel of the self being sovereign and the way to that sovereignty is through the path of wholeness, of bringing together all of these nine aspects of ourselves into a place of balance, to know ourselves, to acknowledge the places that need growth needs to happen and to see what we can do about that, to acknowledge the places where we are in mastery and to see what we need to do about that and to bring all of those together in this concept of being whole, which is different than being perfect. Because when we're whole, we can move through the world in a way that acknowledges, you know what, this is perhaps something someone else should do, or perhaps I need to learn more about this before I embark upon it, or I can step forward in this place because this is something that I do well or or a resource that I have in abundance that I can share forth. And knowing that part of ourselves is help what helps us to be sovereign. And so I think more so than this idea, because, you know, I, I think a lot of us kind of have this Harry Potter kind of perspective that I need to go and find the house, which of the nine paths is my path and to walk it. And certainly that is part of it. But I think the bigger part of it is to find that ninefold within ourselves, to acknowledge the parts of ourselves, not only just as you say, you know, um, you know, a lot of us have a lot of different gifts, and you know, sometimes on the artisan, sometimes being a priestess, in my experience, has been the necessity to bring all of those things together, uh, it, it, to be in best service. But I think to understand ourselves, to use this ninefold as a, uh, as, as, a as a central organizing principle, uh, helps us to assess ourselves and to bring those pieces of ourselves into balance. And I think that more than anything else is uh, is the key to coming into sovereignty. And, and it's such a journey because you, you start with this idea that I'm this mm-hmm. and as 
you know, taking that journey toward healing and you find that I'm not just this, I'm so many different mm-hmm. things. And I am legion. <laughs> yes, yes. There's, there's so many of us inside and it's it, finding them, integrating them into that whole. Hmm. I think that's a lifelong journey. Oh, certainly. Certainly. And that's, but, but I think, I think coming into wholeness is important, like knowing ourselves. I mean, we kind of, we're, we're always going to come in deeper uh, acknowledgement and, and relationship with ourselves, but we can find that inner map, right? To that inner landscape to know, okay, there's, those are the, those are the boggy regions. And maybe I'm not ready to, 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 you know, to create the tracks through there, but I know that it's there. And so, you know, we can get a sense of the wholeness of ourselves, even just to say that these are the shadow places that I'm not ready for. These are the power places. Maybe I'm not ready for those as well, but to get a sense and, and then to deepen our understanding of those places, that's, that's, that's the journey. But I don't think we have to wait a long time to, to find those pieces of ourselves. So um, how would you say the nine paths came together for you? That each, what each of the nine were, are, how we hold them? Mm -hmm. Well, that, I I go into a lot of the detail in, in the book, but this is, this was my essential piece is that, I mean, I knew, so the earliest mention of Avalon comes to us from Jeffrey of Monmouth. And he mentions that Morgan and her sisters, they were nine women who, uh, Create, who ruled Avalon with a set of pleasant laws, and he expl- and, and he described it. And I talk a lot about Jeffrey of Monmouth as a source and his, you know, the pros and the cons of Jeffrey of Monmouth as a source. So whatever you may think about him, uh, this is the first piece of writing that's there. So it sets up from the beginning that there are these nine sisters, and he sets up and he talks about how they are. They are learned women. That they are, you know, they are healers and mathematicians and seers and uh, musicians and um, and and a lot of different a lot of different things. So um, and. When I looked at some of the historical uh, references we have to ninefold sisterhoods, uh, women living on islands that come to us from from uh, Roman tradition, both from the first century BCE and the first century CE, so about 200 years, uh, two different uh, islands of women off the coast of Gaul, what we see as Brittany today, um, that these women also, they were said to have a multiple uh, functions. They were weather workers. They were seers. They were augurs. They were healers. They could, they could, you know, they could calm the seas. They could, you know, um, you know, heal, heal the ill. And uh, they were sought out for their skills. And so there is this kind of repetition, this idea that there are these women that had these functions. So these groups of women with multiple functions. And then when I looked at even the individual sacred women, we see there are women who were seers. There were women who were diplomats, who, who were holy women, who were priestesses or, um, you know, women of that level uh, in that from the historical record. And then we have the legends of women as poets, as Bandrui, as druidesses, as poetesses in Irish tradition. And, uh, you know, we have similar things in Welsh tradition. So to to bring all of these things together, what were sacred women doing? What were what were the things that they had in common? Um, and what does what is that telling us about how that processed? how that progressed, how that manifested in Celtic tradition. If this is in the lore, if this is what the Romans saw, if this can persisted over hundreds of years that we have this, uh, this story about it, what could that have looked like? And so I had this sense of it, um, you know, and of course there's the famous nine group, ninefold group, which is the, that we know the most about, which is where the muses of ancient Greece. And there are actually a lot of uh, parallels between, you know, um, the bardic tradition and the poetic tradition in Greece, which is a fascinating uh, thing. And I, and I dip my toe into that in this book as well, but um, to find the ninefold, to see what the ninefold could have looked like, you know, um, I was doing my best to figure out how this worked and how it worked for me is I get the sense of when priestessing, when I talk about it being a door that opens and closes between this world and the other world. And when I see what comes through, there's this revitalizing energy. So when a woman is, or, or, or a priestess or the goddess is, uh, or, or a vessel that is the stand-in for sovereignty, uh, comes into this alchemical union with the would-be king, what does it do? It revitalizes the land. It takes the um the the wasteland and it makes it fertile again. So there's this creative force, this, you know, this revitalizing energy. And it's the same with the idea of the the Awen that comes through the cauldron of Caridwin or the cauldron of the ninefold uh, that comes through to the to the poets to make them the bards. And so there, again, there is this creative energetic force. And so I knew that it had to do with the Awen, with the divine inspiration 
aspiration. And so what eventually came through in my work is the idea that um, that the ninefold can be seen when we see the three rays of Awen manifest through the three realms. So the three rays, which we in, we talk about is the, the silver ray, the crystal ray, and the gold ray, uh, this passive, neutral, and active energy uh, manifesting through the three realms, through the realm of sky, through the realm of land, and through the realm of sea. And so what that creates is this grid of this uh, you know, discrete energetics, nine different energies. So we have the three rays in the realm of sea, the three rays in the realm of land, the three rays in the realm of sky. And each one of those represents a particular energetic of the ninefold. And taken together, it is the wholeness of creation, what has been, what is, and what can yet be. And there's a multiple ways of looking at it. But that was the guideline. That was the energetic guideline that I used to kind of uh, start to pull together when I knew it was there. It was this, um, you know, so I don't, I can't say with any, with any certainty, certainly that this was ancient and whatever, but, you know, I, I do go through pains in the book to explain my process so that people understand where I'm coming from. But I use this sense of matching up these discrete energies, because if you think about the silver ray in the realm of sky versus the gold ray in the realm of land, there's a very different energies. And so when we look at the way those look, then I looked at the, the roles that I knew that women, um, played in the lore, in the history, uh, within Celtic cultures, and then I kind of matched them together. And so that was where that ninefold came from, and, 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 it, and it, it draws upon um, lore, it draws upon history, it draws upon uh, the cosmology that we have, you know, kind of pulled together from what we know about the Celts, and I talk about them in, 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 the, in the plural culture. Um, uh, and so, and so that was the guiding principle. So that's where everything proceeded from. That was a long answer to a short question. No, it was actually great because so I was going to touch on the the realms mm -hmm. with the woman. Um, because I I was <laughs> I I sound like a fangirl. I'm sorry. I was uh, I was fascinated when I got to that point because I don't really think of that. I have never thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. So each of the rays and each of the realms are inherent in each of the nine. Yes. Yeah, so the ninefold is also fractal. So if each energy or each each of the nine paths have within it an, the ninefold. So because it's a whole path, it has to have a wholeness within it. And so part of the work is to familiarize oneself. This is in the in the uh, the party in the back part of the book uh, with the, the nine paths, and then to look at the discrete currents within the nine within that path where you see the nine. So yes, there's the nine within the nine. So it gets kind of granular, but uh, I think it goes to show that um, there are many, not only are there these nine overall overarching paths of service, of uh, energy and service within ourselves, but there's nine within that ninefold. So there is, what that means is that uh, let's say one of the paths is the is the path of the of the of the of the lore keeper. Um, but there are many ways of being a lore keeper. And so if we look at it, you know, nine within the nine, that's 81, and there are so many more, you know, iterations of that. So there are many ways to be in priestess service. And the thing for me that I always come back to is that. You know, we focus on this idea of wholeness. We focus on the sovereignty of self-understanding, of being in uh, you know conscious uh, determination of our lives. And so it doesn't make sense to me, and it never made sense to me that being a priestess means that you have to still fit into a particular box. I think there are ways of being a priestess that are going to be in mo in strongest harmony with our, with our, with our, with the flame that is within us, within our own, within our own central hearth fire. That is a reflection of our authentic self. And it will have a resonance with one of these nine and an aspect of it, but it's going to be uh, our own. It never made sense to me, this idea that to be a priestess, it had to look a particular way. I do think that there is foundational work. I think that there's study. I think that there's practice, certainly. Um, but once those things are mastered, then to move into that path of authenticity uh founded on tradition uh and um and empowered by a degree of mastery and whatever that path may be uh it, it can look like whatever it is it needs to look like for us so um do you think that just into starting to do the work use the tools that you talk about in the book doing the practice finding all of the ninefold within ourselves mm -hmm. into 
each one separately is going to ease us because I find sovereignty very hard to mm -hmm. grasp or I have moments of it. Mm -hmm. it's, it just hits and it's like, I'm strong. I'm, I'm, and then there's the other times when you just, you don't feel that at all. Mm -hmm. So would you say just integrating all this and doing all this work is really going to help us to grasp that, that sovereignty and our, our authenticity that we're all looking for. I think we all strive to be authentic, but it's the sovereign part of knowing that, you know, you're, you're in charge of your own destiny. Well, I think sovereignty can look like saying no or turning something away or, 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 or not engaging in something that we don't feel strong enough to engage with. I think that can be sovereign as well. I think sovereignty is founded on this self-knowledge of knowing the parts of ourselves and knowing where our work is and knowing, you know, what is in our best interest. I think sovereignty uh, in its in its wholeness is this idea that um, I know myself well enough to know uh, what, is, how I'm going, how, how this situation uh, impacts me, uh, how proceeding on a path will impact me, and to make choices that are a reflection of that self-knowledge. Sometimes we say no to things without knowing why, and sometimes those are unconscious fears, sometimes these are limitations we've accepted about ourselves, but sometimes we can say no to something knowing that you know, this is a place of pain for me and choosing not to do it doesn't make you weak. It makes you strong to say, I'm not engaging with that because I'm not ready for it. I don't have the tools for it. I don't want to deal with the pain that I know is there and I'm going to choose a different way. That's sovereign. It doesn't mean I'm a badass and I'm going to barrel through the things because sometimes that is not the right, the right, you know, path for us as well. So yes, I do think that the path to sovereignty requires us to know ourselves as best as we can. And knowing ourselves and using this ninefold as a rubric, as a way of understanding the, the aspects of ourselves. Like, you know, so we talk about the nine, uh, they're the lore keeper. And when we, for example, when we reflect that upon ourselves, it's what is our story? What is my history? What is What has come before? Uh, let me honor the person that I have been. Uh, let me see the person that I am and understand how I got here. And then how do I write the story to come? See, this is this is how we reflect the nine within ourselves. The law speaker, it's um, our, our, our morals, our ethics, uh, our, our sense of right and wrong. It's the places where we are, you know, the things that are important to us in our, in our lives and what we are going to stand up for. And if the things that we've been taught in the past are not in alignment with the person that we actually are, how do we shift that going forward? How do we change our mind? What are our biases? These are the things that the law speaker is trying to get us to do. The the um the the emissary is is about relationship and communication. It's about speaking clearly what our needs are and hearing clearly what others are communicating to ourselves. Because we also come into relationships with others or in situations uh, with uh, a, a with our biases with a pre you know, sometimes we don't speak our truths. Sometimes we, we can't speak, say what we need, or we'll, we'll, we'll beat around the bush, or we'll expect other people to understand uh, what we actually need. And we're not communicating clearly, or we're being passive aggressive, or we're hearing in others' speech to us, um, criticism or, um, or, 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 or things that are just not there. So learning to be clear, both in how we hear and what we say is, is a huge part of that. And to understand how to be uh, in good relationship with other people, how to have a balanced relationship. And so each of them are the same thing. Uh, you know, the artisan is, you know, what is our, what is my work in the world? Uh, what is my vocation? Uh, what do I create? You know, what do I choose to put forth in the world? How do I, how do I construct it? What do I, you know, that's that's part of that artisan piece and it goes on and on uh i could go through all of them i don't know if you want me to but uh but they all have an application within us and so it says to us am i speaking with clarity am i am i using my you know the the, the law uh, the, the hearth tender am i using my resources wisely am i is this a sustainable way of being do i have what i need and if i don't why don't i what do i need to do to shift that um you know, the guardian is about, is about our boundaries, is about, you know, our strength, is about what, are we, what are we going to defend and what are we going to change in the world that isn't in, um, in, in resonance with what we know to be right and true. How do we, how do we, how do we maintain that and affect change for others? The seer, right, is, are we listening to our intuition? Are we, are we trusting those parts of ourselves that, that are coming through us? Are we seeing the signs? Are we in good communication with source, with our, with our intuition, with our instinct? Um, the healer, are we living a balanced life? Are we doing what we need to, to have a healthy environment, have a healthy 
you know, body, mind, spirits? Are we, are we, are we seeking wholeness? And then ritualist to me is about devotion. It's about how are we expressing and honoring the divine around us and within us? How are we following the cycles of nature? How are we, how are we celebrating those rites of passage? How are we, um, how are we acknowledging uh, our own sacred um, process and being in relationship with the divine? So all of these things have external, and th that's just a real, like, two second, um, uh, what is it, tour of the ninefold within, but these are all ways that we can use the ninefold to assess. Where are we? How are we proceeding? Where do we, uh, where are we shining? Where do we need um, healing? What needs to be carried? What can be um, brought forward? It's, uh, I have found it to be very helpful. And yes, this is the fund foundation of coming into sovereignty, of knowing ourselves well enough to know uh, the truth of a situation and where we, how we respond to that situation. I was just thinking though, when you were speaking that some of these situations that you discussed, um, you know, not speaking our truth mm -hmm. or looking at some of the things that, you know, it's like saying no can be thought of as a strength, but we're like, as women, we're taught that we do what we're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So if we're not speaking our truth, that's because we feel, or speaking for myself, you know, we're not supposed to do that. So it's like some of the things that we were brainwashed at as we're growing up stops us from thinking of certain things as our power when in reality it is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, a lot of people are, we can be people pleasers. We don't want anybody to be mad at us. We don't want, you know, to hurt people's feelings by saying no. And part of, I think the wholeness is, you know, to recognize that, let's say, for example, we have that, oh, I can't say no, I can't say no. But healing that piece then is part of the work of the other books that I've talked about, you know, is say, why am I a people pleaser? Where did I learn this? Uh, what happened to me in my past? Or what was the culture of my family? Or, you know, how did I come into this place where I feel like people will hate me or I, that I need the validation of other people? What are the things that are part of my story, the Lord keeper piece that has led me to where I am now? And how can I rewrite that? And perhaps I don't need to, uh, but if, if you if you acknowledge that that is something that is not authentic, that isn't in your best interest, that you're acting from a place in the past, something you learned before that doesn't have to do with what is in the moment today, what your options are today. Because that's the thing, a lot of our shadow arises from um, uh, adaptations to situations that we're in, like we're trying to survive. So whether it was, you know, a, a family of origin situation or bad relationships that you were in or something that you learned out in, uh, in, in the, you know, in, in, in the workforce, um, we internalize these things and then it becomes part of who we are. But when we're in situations that are not those old situations and we're still acting from those places, that's where the shadow arises. And that's where it becomes uh, a, a, a manifestation of a dysfunction. It's not helping us anymore. It's keeping us stuck in places that are not present. So that's where we have to say, is this true? Is this what's happening here and now? This is part of that work. So the work of the cycle of healing, which is in Avalon within, and the work of the cycle of revealing, which is in the mythic moons of Avalon. These are cycles of helping us to reflect within ourselves, to understand ourselves better, um, through our, our inner landscape, which is Avalon within, through our finding our reflections in the stories of the goddesses that we work with, the Welsh goddesses um, it, that we work with in our tradition, that's mythic moons. And then this is about that ninefold piece, that being in priest of service and how to bridge the parts of ourselves and also how to be a bridge in service in the community and how to be a bridge through all of it uh, in service to the divine. And yes, Erin, I see that you're asking. Uh, yes, the knife, all of this I'm talking about is 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 in the book about the, that inner reflection. Yay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, I just wanted to bring up, I don't know if a lot of people are aware of it, and I mentioned it earlier to you. Um, you wrote a short story about the Gala Zene, and they are in the book. Mm hmm and um, of all the ninefolds that you, you know, this ninefold sisterhoods and these these circles and groups of women, what made you pick the Gala Zene specifically to write your short story about? So because I, I found it fascinating because the Galizane and uh, 
is one of the uh, iterations of the ninefold that comes to us from history. So the Romans actually wrote about these two different groups. One is the Samite, uh, Samanite women and the Gleasonae. And so the short story is actually a reflection of both of those uh, together. Um, I found it fascinating for two reasons. One, here is a, uh, a historical source. Now, Roman history doesn't have the same historical um, rigor as it will, as our modern day historians. So we can look at it and say, all right, no, you know, this was uh, secondhand information. So even Roman histories can, can have uh, a, a, a sense of, you know, perhaps as part of legends, you know, where did this come from? So, you know, we can't, we can't um, assume that it's hundred percent true, but it's there in their histories. Um, and, uh, and, I find fascinating this idea of so the uh, so the Gleason name this uh, this um, part of their story is part of these nine folds of these islands off of France is that um, they tended a temple and there was a process by which uh, once a year the temple would be uh, the thatch of the roof of the temple would be taken down and new thatch had to be put up and it was done as the story goes, uh, before the sun. So from sunset to sunrise. So no light could hit, it had to happen in darkness. Uh, and uh, these priestesses who lived on the island were the ones who were taking down the thatch and putting up the thatch. And so they had to complete that work overnight. And uh, if one of them were to drop their bundle, it would be seen as a sign. And then the other sisters would descend upon them and rip them to pieces as a sacrifice. And the story of the Romans, so what the Romans say is that, and sometimes they would bump each other, right? So that someone would drop the drop the straw uh, and then be the sacrifice. And so um, that part specifically is about the Samanite women, um, that they would do this piece and that they were in service to this. Uh, he called, uh, so the, um, the historian said that they were in service to uh, like a Bacchus, like it was a Dionysian kind of divinity because of this um, ritual kind of uh, fervor, which with they would destroy each other. And so for me, it was like, what would, what would, I, I find human sacrifice kind of fascinating. I will say this too, about the bog bodies and about this thing. And, you know, um, there is a sense sometimes when we look at, because we do know that the Celts did participate in human sacrifice uh, to the degree that. Caesar and others have written about it, you know, we're not entirely sure, but I mean, there is archaeological evidence that this happened. And, and what is interesting about it is that, like with the bog bodies, for example, both in Britain and in, and in Ireland, um, the, the the people who were sacrificed were highborn. They were, uh, you know, they weren't, you know, they ate well, they didn't have calloused hands. It, they weren't, you know, they, they seemed to be of nobility. And so there's a sense of, you know, what was part of the culture that said, you know what, it's an honor for me to die, to go before the gods, to plead the case of my people. Um, and, and so, you know, we don't, it doesn't have that existential horror that we in today look back on, just, how could they do this to each other? How can we, you know, we can kind of get our minds around, you know, animal sacrifice, but human sacrifice, but the idea of human sacrifice, that would be a willing sacrifice that would see that as part of their, their service as a, as a priestess or, uh, you know, um, or a sacred, uh, you know, king or what have you uh that has always fascinated me so that was the reason for that story so thank you for that no, for it was a, that it's a great story if, uh for anyone who's interested it is on uh amazon on kindle for 99 cents <laughs> and uh, i encourage all of you to read it because i enjoyed it Aww. immensely i think it was oh, the first you. you posted it a few years ago that mm -hmm. i read i think it's great and i i highly recommend it for all of you um oh, thank you guys one of one of the questions, or I'd like to ask this question and then open it up to um, everyone watching if if they have questions. Uh, this came up out of my um, interview with Christopher Hughes last month, and he had mentioned, and I know it's something that we talk about, is that the SOA is Druid adjacent. So, how would you, for those who aren't that familiar with you know Druidry, how would how would what exactly does that mean? Sisterhood of Avalon is Druid adjacent. So um, it kind of started as a little bit of a joke, but I think it's an apt uh, description because um, I think that um, the modern path of Druidry has many iterations, but I think for most of them, um, you know, you are studying with an order, um, you know, you, you undergo their training, uh, 
you know, what the Druids did in, uh, in in antiquity, we really don't know. We have some hints. We have some sense of things that they would have learned. We have some sense of how long their training programs would have been. And so it's kind of the thing that I personally, in my path over the over the decades, um, have been a little um, loath to call myself a Druid because I don't, you know, or to, because we don't know, like, how would I, you know, because it's a very specific cultural term. It's a very specific cultural um, uh, uh had a very specific function within the the culture of the Iron Age cults, and so um, so we see we're, we're Druid adjacent in part because we are looking at the same materials, we are looking at the same divinities, but we're looking at them from a different perspective. We're looking at it from this perspective of the ninefold, from the perspective of the feminine. Um, and that's not to say that women who are in the sisterhood or or myself are, are not in relationship with you know male divinities within the tradition. I certainly am, but um, but that our focus is about the female experience, is about you know bringing forth this idea that you know in the past, if we are to say that the Romans are correct and that there were these. Um, these enclaves of women, they were contemporaneous with what we know the, the Druid orders in the Iron Age existed. Why did they exist side by side? There is a sense that women uh, could be Druids. And in the book, I explore that, that that is not as quite as certain as we as we accept it to be today, to be honest with you, I looked at all of the materials and um, I was a little surprised that uh, it's kind of tenuous at best, but I personally believe that there were female Druids because it seems like um, there were the barriers of um, uh of participation uh, for women were were, were much uh, less in, in what we know of some of the Celtic traditions. Uh, but um, but anyway, yeah, that uh, there were these two seeming side by side orders that existed together. So they they had to have um, uh, complementary purposes. Like, what would make sense for them to be redundant? And so part of, I guess, the adjacent thing is, you know, what what did what what in what what were the differences in the ways that they were in service to community? Yeah, the female druids in Ireland. Yeah, that's a long discussion. I can talk about it. Uh, a little bit, but um, so the Druids in, see, here's the thing, that the idea of what a Druid means has shifted over time. So the prehistoric, the the, the first century CE uh, and BCE, when the Romans and the Greeks were in contact with Druids, by the time we get to the written uh, Irish tradition, it's about a thousand years later, and the term Druid changed in meaning. So we get the sense that the, the the Druids of the Iron Age, and I think in neo-paganism, we do this a lot. We conflate the Druids of the Iron Age with the Druids that we see in the Irish stories, in the later stories. And there's no, there's no, um, there's no proof that that is the case, that it is the same. The cultures have shifted. And also we see that the word Druid in Irish tradition is often translated back and forth. So Ireland is a little bit different than Wales. And um in terms of when their stuff was written down. And in Irish tradition, the word for Druid, when it is translated from Latin materials to, to Irish materials, and then later when Irish was translated into Latin, the word for Druid was translated as Magus, and Magus was translated as Druid. So it came to simply mean someone who uses magic. And when we look at the stories of the Druids, and we look at the Druidesses that we see in the Irish stories, you know, we and the poetesses, we see them as, as those who are engaging with the other world. But the difference that we see between those Irish stories and those Gallic stories from the first centuries, um, both BCE and CE, uh, is that they're, they're not shown serving a religious function. Whereas we know in the Iron Age that the Druids were a, 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 a class that was a professional class, but they had a religious function and that religious function is not present in the story. So uh, that was my piece too. It was like, oh goodness, so that kind of sucks because I was hoping that it was like, oh, the women Druids, but the there were female poetesses or female seers. And we do see over and over over again that in 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 throughout the Celtic traditions and throughout time that women were always associated with being seers and we see it in the Germanic traditions as well but the idea that there is this continuity of of um of what the orders were from Iron Age to uh early medieval Ireland uh it the material is just not in support of that so Yes, the Volvas, exactly. So, uh, so I, I write a lot, a lot about that as well in in the book. So it's all there in the in the in the in that chapter about the holy women. Um, yes, I was disappointed in it too, but uh, that seems to be the case, and that's that's what we know.
Ta-da. Ta-da. Okay, so would you like to talk about your online class? Oh, yes, there's, I have an, uh, the next iteration of, um, of my online class. Um, yeah, I was just reading the side. Well, that's more than we could talk about right now, unfortunately, but, uh, but, but let's talk about it at some point, the, the Druids, um, the, um, oh, so my online classes, I have a couple of, uh, um, of a, uh, 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 a series and the new, uh, iteration of the, um, goodness, I just, uh, it's gone out of my head. Uh, so it's Seeds of Devotion. It's a six month, uh, um, immersion in working with the five goddesses that we work with in the Avalonian tradition. So they're Welsh divinities. And, and regardless of the tradition that you follow, if you are a devote, the devotee of these goddesses, uh, this information is going to be uh, of, of interest to you. So it's Bladiwith, Arianhood, Rhiannon, Caridwyn, Bronwyn. Um, so there's a five in depth from a cultural perspective, from a, a lore perspective, and also the, the sixth um, well, the first one is to, how to read myth, how to read uh, these stories, how to extract uh, the information that we need, because um, the stories in the medieval period uh, don't point to their divinity, um, because at that time, the stories were written down, there was no paganism that was being practiced. And so we have to kind of do a little mythic archaeology to get to the heart of things. And so not only are you going to learn those pieces and what in... Um, informs them, but how to read myth in a particular way. Uh, so there's that, but yeah. And then I have my um, um, uh, journey to Avalon, walking the path of the priestess, a new iteration will start in uh, the beginning of January. And uh, yeah, I have a couple of other things that are coming up um, online uh, circles for working the, uh, the cycle of revealing, the cycle of healing. So that stuff is coming up. So if you're not on my mailing list, you might want to join it. Uh, if you go to, uh, we'll, we'll put the links in, but my link tree has all of the stuff. And uh, I put out a very low volume uh, newsletter and all the information will be there. And if you follow me on social media, all of the information will be there as well. Excellent. Thank you. So is there anything is um, we talked, did you want to read another excerpt from the book? Or is there something that you would like to well, I think uh, if people would like, if there are any questions, um, they can post, they can open to that. And yeah, I don't, you know, and then we can see. I'm trying to find, I was just want to post my link tree in the, uh, in the comments so that people can find all the things. I agree. So yeah, if Deb there are any questions. saying that she took, she took the seeds of de devotion and it was awesome. Oh, yay. Thank you. Oh gosh, that, that is not what I wanted. Okay. <laughs> So let me just do that. Um, are there any other questions or comments or? You can put your questions in the chat that you might have for Jenna. Not me, let's see. Yeah. <laughs> I just talked everyone's ear off, didn't I? No questions. <laughs> That's strange. <laughs> So, um, you so had, hmm? started mentioned earlier the um, so I was going to ask how this book relates to the other two, and you touched on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're Which, all different layers of the tradition. Um, so the, if all three of them, and 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 my intention actually when I did the um, the Avalonian Oracle is that all of this information is in there. So we have the um, the stations of the wheel, the, the cycle of the year, uh, in the um, uh, in the cycle of healing. So that's Avalon within. So it's the inner landscape and and the landscape of you know of the cycle around us. Um, the ninefold. I'm sorry. The uh, the moons of the year. Uh, the stories of the goddesses and the cycle of revealing. So each uh, of these pearls around the cauldron of transformation, different moons, different connections to different aspects of goddess stories. Uh, and that's myth, mythic moons. And then this nine folds, which I associate with different phases of the moon as well. But this really is about that nine folds um, uh, uh, path. That that's here, and I'm seeing a. This is a great question. I'm sorry, Sarah Lewis. After all the research you've done now, has it changed your view of Avalon that you had when you wrote Avalon Within? Um, and, and my view of Avalon has shifted a great deal, actually, um, 
from writing that in uh, in part because of uh between those books i've read i i would i earned my master's degree in celtic studies and so while i think the the process and uh the work of avalon within is solid and i wouldn't change that i think that um you know, I think my perspective, I just saw cat, cat tail. I think my perspective of, um, of Avalon has shifted in that, um, I, I believe that Avalon resides fully in the other world, that it is an otherworldly island, uh, and that because it's an otherworldly island, my, my concept of the other world is that the other world is anything that is not this world. So in, in Welsh tradition, a noon, or Anuven is the other world. And it means the very deep or the not world. And so it is both what is within us, you know, that deep, that deep place, um, that below place, but it is also what is not. So uh things that are past that are no longer present, things that are in our past are in the other world, right? They're in memory, they're in they're in um, the, the realm of sea and things that are not yet, things that we think about, things that have not manifest, things that are ideas and things that are stories and tales. Those are also in the other world because they are not of this world. So whether Avalon, as we have come to know her, and, and as I've said, it's informed by so many different um, currents to form this stream of tradition that encompasses so many different ideas of what Avalon is um, that uh, holds because it's shifted and changed over time and it's meant so many different things to so many different people and so many different time periods. Um, that uh, the Avalon can't be confined to a specific place. And I think that there was something to be said for the thousand years-ish that Avalon has been associated with Glastonbury and, and being in Glastonbury and Glastonbury as a place is a powerful space, regardless of its connection to Avalon. The, if you want to talk about the ley lines, if you want to talk about those sacred springs, if you want to talk about, you know, the fact that there is this strange hill that, you know, is the only thing like it within 25 miles in any direction. There is a lot about the place that is sacred. And we know that the Neolithic peoples also consider it sacred and, and it's been sacred for forever. Um, but that Avalon has come to reside there, that the, the landscape has, it holds the lore. There is a process by which that has occurred. And so I think that going to Glastonbury and being in that space is a place, it's a bridge, it's a really powerful bridge. It's a bridge that people have believed exists for thousands of years. And it's a really, a really easy way to connect with the energies of Avalon. But I don't think that it is Avalon. I think that it is a bridge to Avalon. I think it is a way of entering into that space. I think uh, there's a Welsh tradition, a, a Welsh place, Bardsey Island, with, that has all of the hallmarks of Avalon. But I think Avalon exists in places of liminality. And I think that that's why we can access Avalon within, because she is an island of the other worlds. We can get there through lore. We can get there through story. We can get there through ritual. That's a part of what we're talking about here too. If the priestesses and us in our priestess service are building bridges, what are we building a bridge to? We're building a bridge to Avalon, and there are many different ways to access it, many different ways to get there. Uh, and they take mastery, and they take time, and they take practice, and they take study, but it's worth it because that is how we build a bridge. And so I, um, so I do think that... Um, Avalon as residing specifically, you know, there are these correspondences in Avalon within that, you know, each of the stations of the cycle of healing have specific places in the landscape of Glastonbury. But again, I think that I would be a, a bit more, um, I, I would say that these are, these are um, doorways in, but that they, they are not specifically um, what defines a physical um, manifestation of Avalon if that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, because of the breadth and depth of the, uh, where do you success when starts? I think the, yeah, I mean, I think the three books in 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 their unfolding, they 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 are meant to build upon each other. Um, I think that uh, doing the work, I, I think if you're interested in the history of Avalon, in the parts that have come together, what informs what it is today. I think the, like I said, our mullet, the mullet book, you know, the the business in the front part is going to be helpful. Uh, but I think the practice in the back is better served if you have come to some sense of self-knowledge, the kind of knowledge that will come to you through working the cycle of healing, through working the cycle of revealing. So I think that that will be important because the work of the back of the book requires, I mean, there's no, there's no one to check your work. 
you have to have built a sense of discernment to be able to tell the difference between the voice of your sovereignty and the um and the lies i guess of the of the shadow right to know the difference between you know to have that discernment between what is sacred and what is um and what is shadow what is what is telling you to be small what is telling you uh you know incorrectly uh sometimes it's an inflation of ego sometimes it's um uh you know uh a desire to be small to remain small so so i think at least going through the cycle of the cycle of healing and the cycle of revealing of you know the of the mythic moons is is a complement the two of them work very well together cycle of healing and cycle of revealing so take one of them work it for a cycle do the work to build that sense of discernment, um, to know yourself well enough. And I think that if you have engaged in other kinds of work, if you've, you know, if you're, if you've done therapy, if you've, um, you know, have done other, um, other inner work that has, you know, brought that degree of self-knowledge that you know the difference between those two voices that um, then to proceed would be good. But I think that that at, at the very least to have that sense of discernment and to know that your inner landscape to know and map that inner inner landscape so you know the places where mm, maybe I need a little more self-reflection on this or oh yes I can move forward uh, I think that would be important to do the work of the ninefold that's in uh that's in the that's in the new book the mullet book the mullet book uh Rhea is asking could you tell me a resource to go in order to find sheep like waves i am fascinated with sheep so um i'm pretty sure that those are um that i that i have the the cert i know what you're talking about so um i can't pronounce her name but there is a um in in wales and she it lives in the waves between uh the, the mainland and um and bardsey island there is a uh, gwynhedi who in some sources is said to be the wife of Gwydion, which I find interesting, yes. Um, that um, she she has uh, nine sheep and there are eight sheep and uh, that are ewes, the female sheep, and then the ninth one is the ram. So the ninth, the ninth wave is always the strongest one. Um, and that's really the information that's there. I'm fairly certain that, that um, in the book I have um indicated where I got it from uh because I don't know off the top of my head but uh if you ask me again on uh on the face page Rhea I can uh, I can give you that source thank you mm -hmm. okay does anybody else have any questions before we move on and say good night anyone then I, then I can read that little that little back piece. oh that would be excellent thank you Jenna I think I've uh... yes, okay. okay. Engaging with Avalon as a living entity frees her from the static conception of merely existing as a relic of bygone days. A truth irrevocably lost in the mists of legend and pseudo-history, blurred by the hazy memories of an elusive pagan past. Certainly, she can still inspire us in this form, but entering into relationship with the living Avalon opens doorways to so much more. As the island of healing, she provides us with hope for the restoration and the promise of peace that would mark King Arthur's return in our time of greatest need while the living Avalon also contains the prospect of achieving a state of wholeness through the reclamation of our own sovereignty, while teaching us to maintain strong boundaries in support of our personal realms. As a fortunate island that provides whatever is needed of its own accord, connecting with the living Avalon gives us with a limitless source of spiritual abundance that teaches us how to meet our own needs and provides inner nourishment to assist us in furthering our aspirations and actualizing our greatest potentials. As the priestess isle, Avalon provides a template for how to be in sacred community, especially of and with women, while engaging with the living Avalon reveals a process for walking the path of the Avalonian priestess in this day and age, a sovereign path guided by an ethos of personal integrity, collective responsibility, and devotional service. 
And finally, the living Avalon of the mythic other worlds can be perceived as a cosmological map that helps us identify our place in the universe, our work in the world, and the sparks of wisdom within ourselves. She can teach us how to harness the energies of wholeness represented by the ninefold in our own lives, within and around us, and in doing so, can bring us into balanced relationship with what is beyond us, the divine mysteries that are the source of the stream of tradition that has come to be expressed as and through Avalon. So. Thank you, Jenna. There you go. Thank uh, you all. Thank you, Morgane and Shaw Thank and everyone you. who's here. Um, yes, I'm so glad we were able to get this done. And, and this has been wonderful. Thank you. Um, I just want to mention that in October for Coracle mm -hmm. Live, we will be speaking to uh, Justine Journey. And also in October on the 21st, Christopher Hughes will be presenting his workshop on Aline of the Ways. Um, both links to both of these will be able to be found on the Sisterhood of Avalon Facebook page. And uh, Christopher will be through Eventbrite and Coracle Live will be the same as we did this evening. There'll be a pre-registration. You can um, find the link to that also on the Facebook page. So I thank you very, very much for joining us tonight. Jenna, I thank you so much for you know, for joining us, giving us your time. And um, I encourage everyone to go out and buy all the books because they do make, they complement each other very, very well. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you for this. Thank you all for coming. And um, yeah, let's continue the discussion. Um, okay. Wherever, okay. wherever things are. Okay. All right. Blessings all. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you.